Welcome to Haunt Tech Tips, the source for technical advice to take your haunted attraction to the next level. Here's your host, Chris Gay. Welcome back, everyone. This will be our first full episode after Transworld. It took a little while to recoup, but we've had some great video content from that. This is going to be a long episode. We're going to be discussing commercial and residential fire alarm. So make some popcorn, kick back, and here we go. Start with this standard disclaimer. This is for awareness only. Local fire codes will vary. Building codes as well. The technology and methods for fire alarms are always changing and do vary locally. Look into these things before you buy a location. This is huge, especially in haunts, because a lot of the time we're using warehouses, older venues, decommissioned facilities. It's very possible you might come across something in a venue that looks great otherwise that you won't be able to use your fog machines in, you won't be able to use special effects you'd like to, or worst, you could have a costly nightmare to maintain if you run into a halon system or a pre-action system, something like that that's going to need some annual work beyond just inspections. We'll start out basic, the types of alarm systems. From the ground up, you have monitored systems and unmonitored systems. Monitored, typically everything's wired to one place, and that's going to reach out to a call center. Be it ADT, Tyco, there's countless monitoring centers out there. Branks, there's several. Local installers will use different companies you've probably never heard of. Long story short, it's all a panel dials back to a location. They have numbers on file they call your local dispatch center and tell them what the alarm is saying, be it a general fire alarm or be it a specific XYZ zone is going off, so on and so forth. If you come into a situation where you have to sign a monitoring contract to take over a system, read the fine print here. Some of the bigger alarm companies out there are known to sneak some terms into contracts that are crazy, be it multi-year clauses, buyout clauses, monitoring rates that inflate over time. You shouldn't be paying more than $50 to $60 a month for commercial fire alarm monitoring, more if there's burglar alarm added with that. Just be very careful here. I've seen some other businesses get in way over their heads way overpaying for old, outdated equipment. Also, be careful with service contracts that are attached to this. They can be beneficial, but at the same time, if your system doesn't break, you can spend a lot of money not doing anything. But you do want to have your system tested, so see if that falls into the contract, into the service contract, and just make sure it makes sense. If uh, they're going to charge you $250 for a test on a fire system you're only using for a couple months, but the service contract is $1,000 a year, well, there you go. Maybe just have the inspection done and no contract. It's up to you. Just read the fine print here. These monitor systems require typically a phone line. There are cellular backups. In some areas, cell primary is available, but not all areas allow that. There are conventional loop systems, meaning... It's a cheaper system, it's more basic. The wires go out in zones, a zone being a group of detectors. If it's a small building, it might be one zone. So the alarm goes off, it might just say alarm. If you have multi-zones, it might say zone one, first floor, zone two, second floor, zone three, warehouse, so on and so forth. Problem here is for the fire department, or you, you don't really know where the alarm is at other than a general area because multiple sensors are on a zone. And the way that loop works is the sensor interrupts the loop, then the alarm panel senses that change in resistance and sets an alarm off. These systems are cheaper. In older facilities, that's probably what you'll see. In newer facilities, you'll see addressable devices. So there's constant communication from all the devices back to the control panel. This will tell you the device location, if it's programmed correctly. It's not always programmed correctly. It will tell you what's up with the device, if it's a trouble alert, if it detected smoke, if it detected heat, so on and so forth. These usually also give you less false alarms, but they're more expensive, more complicated. It all boils back to the programming that the alarm company installing the system did. If they were lazy, your detectors might just be numbered. There might be a list saying what the numbers go to, but it's very possible that 
depending on the facility, depending on the programmer. What you see on screen may or may not be correct. If a facility were to remodel, you might even see if you have, per se, an old nursing home. There's a smoke condition in the doctor's lounge, which may have turned into a patient's room or an office. Who knows? Usually these names aren't updated over the years, but hopefully it'll at least give you a general idea of where the alarm is at. Beyond monitor systems, which you'll usually see in commercial facilities or sometimes residences, you'll also see local-only unmonitored systems. This is typically what you'll see in a residential setting, sometimes small commercial. Usually it's standalone detectors. They may just be battery-powered, hung on the wall or ceiling. Sometimes they're wired together through the house or building's power system, so they'll all trigger at the same time. If one goes off, the others follow. And there's also newer wireless or even Wi-Fi devices so that they all alert together, even though they're just battery devices hung on the wall. For the most part, home haunts are going to be local-only systems. Some may have monitored systems. A lot of newer homes or larger homes do have monitored full systems. The essentials, though, are all the same here, so if you're a home haunter, stay tuned. You'll probably still learn a thing or two here. When it comes to the larger systems, there's always a control panel somewhere. Usually this is a red box, which contains a dialer. That is the piece of electronics that communicates to the alarm company via telephone line. There's sometimes a cell backup, which usually is mounted on the wall or up above it somewhere. So it's not inside the can, so the signal can get out. Sometimes you'll just see an antenna on top of the red can of the control panel, though. There's a power supply. Sometimes that's in the control panel. Sometimes that's a separate box on the wall somewhere, also usually red. There's usually a backup battery, or at least there should be. This will be a 4 or 7 amp hour large lead acid battery that will run the alarm in the event of a power outage. And there's also going to be a keypad for control and programming Sometimes this is integrated in the control panel. Sometimes it's just mounted on the metal can outside of the control panel. Sometimes it's on a wall nearby or around the corner or by the front door. Codes may vary. Usually this is right with the control panel though, so that it can be easily troubleshot, programmed, and set up by the installers. The keypad is usually, but not always, red. There's usually, but not always, a alphanumeric screen on it which will communicate different statuses to you. On older systems, it may just be a series of LED lights and labels. There's a ton of different manufacturers out there, and unfortunately this is not quite as standardized as you would expect it to be. This is cause to know your own system, because the local fire department, hopefully they'll do pre-walkthroughs, pre-plans, things like that, but they probably won't know your system inside and out. There's just so many various systems out there that even if they take classes, there are still differences among system to system that require a learning curve. There's also usually keys for the control panel. Usually the box itself with all the wiring inside is locked. And then sometimes there is a programming key. This may or may not exist, but make sure if you're buying a location that you have access to these keys or sometimes they're just hidden on top of the panel. But this is important because if your alarm were to go off while you're open and you don't have a programming key to reset it, you could have to close for the night and end up calling in a tech because if you can't reset the alarm, they're not going to let you reopen because obviously, A, you don't have an alarm system that's functioning that will warn people if a condition does occur, and B, the things are loud. So you're going to be pretty much deafening your customers. You can't really operate over that. And see if the fire company were to somehow let you totally disable the alarm for the night, which is going to be tricky if the panel is locked, you're going to have, have to have a fire watch, and you don't want to look into the prices of that because that is paying people to cover every so many square foot of your facility, have radios, and be able to evacuate and notify. And long story short, it's a lot of manpower, it's expensive, and it's still less than ideal. That's your control panel. There's also always going to be some sort of detector around, be it a pull station, smoke, carbon monoxide detectors, heat sensors, water flow sensors, visible flame beams detectors. There's several different types out there. At minimum, you're probably going to see pull station smoke detectors, 
And if you don't see those for some reason, there will be water flow sensors if there's a sprinkler system. That way, if the sprinklers go off, it sets off the alarm. There will be notification devices. This will be sirens, bells, horns, strobes, voice speakers. These are just different ways to notify people the alarm has gone off. There are different types of systems out there for suppression that tie in with the fire alarm, be it a sprinkler system that's a wet pipe, a dry pipe, a deluge, halon systems if you prefer to have a server room or electronics room. Again, with haunts, you never know what location you're buying. Some of these old office buildings that are great for haunts might just have a halon system in an office tucked in the corner where the server was. There's also dry chem systems for kitchens and a few different types. We'll dig deeply here into different types of detectors. Full stations, that's the red box on the wall, usually by the door. You either smash a piece of glass, or ideally on the new ones, just pull a little lever. Smashing the glass, yes, it prevents false alarms because people don't want to do that, but you can end up with somebody hurt because they had to smash the glass. That's no bueno. Also, you have to keep spare glass around, and then you have to clean up glass. It's just a hot mess. Conventional pull stations, it is a lever or a push and pull, and they are resettable by key. You probably should have some of these keys that come with the fire alarm control panel. No guarantees, though. Your local fire department may or may not have these keys. Again, there's no one key fits all for these. Make sure to have or obtain keys for your location because otherwise you could have a pull station you can't reset and the fire department may be able to help you. They might not. There are also anti-tamper covers available for these. That way your actors aren't going to bump into them in emergency corridors. Because we all know some of our costumes and outfits have things that dangle, hang, accessories, so on and so forth. The last thing you want to do is have somebody accidentally bump and set off a pull station. That's just bad news. Also, if a pull station is set off, don't reset it. Let the fire department do that. That way they can see that station was activated, and that way they can clear the scene and say, hey, this was activated. They can confirm it, so on and so forth. Smoke detectors. There's a couple, actually several types now. Ionizing or photoelectric are the most common. Ionizing uses a little tiny radioactive element to detect a blockage in the ionization of that between the element and a sensor inside. It detects a flaming fire, so they don't go off until the fire is actually already rolling. They are cheaper though, and they are very common residentially and in older commercial systems. Photoelectric is a detector that has a photo beam inside, and it looks for part particulates in the air. Detects smoldering fires before they really take off into a flaming fire. They are, however, more expensive. Not a lot more expensive, but 5 or $10. However, if you're buying 20 or 30 that does add up. Joe Homeowner is going to buy the cheapest thing out there, so usually most homes are ionizing. Photoelectric does have a huge perk, though, of it usually generates fewer false alarms. You'll see photoelectric sensors are kitchen sensors, or they'll even say, like, in a hallway outside a bathroom. So things like steam or just slightly toasty toast usually aren't going to set off a photoelectric sensor. There are dual tech alarms that have photoelectric and ionizing sensors in them. That way, it'll detect those smoldering fires quickly, but also if the fire just takes right off, it'll get it with the ionizing detector. These are potentially safer, although it depends on the model. Some of them are looking for both photoelectric and ionizing elements to activate. Some are confirming one with the other. Depends manufacturer to manufacturer. Overall, though, for haunt use, photoelectric is likely ideal just because it's going to catch the smoldering fire, because everything in our haunt should be flame retardant. And fires usually, unless something goes bad wrong, shouldn't take off. So it's going to catch that smoldering when that flame retardant material is, you know, one of your patrons is trying to light it, or a halogen lamp somehow makes contact with it. Again, that is a vague recommendation. Check with your local officials on that one. Dual tech alarms, hard to say for haunts. Uh, they are becoming more common. But again, if you're using fog of any sort, 
No guarantees one way or the other. I've seen it set them off in the right concentrations. I will say that. Heat detectors. These are ideal if you want to use fog. So if you're in a warehouse location, something like that, and only have heat detectors, you're great because they are immune to smoke, fog, things like that. However, they are not life safety devices. Heat detectors are either set temperature or rate of rise. A set temperature detector has a solid inside of it that will melt once it reaches a certain temperature. Once it melts, it triggers the alarm. Rate of rise detectors are thermocouples or the like. They're much more sensitive and they look for the temperature to rise so many degrees and a period of time. This way, per se, you're in, say, uh, Canadian hunters up there and it's a very, very cold environment. If the room goes from 30 to 40 degrees in a couple minutes, it's going to set it off if that's enough of a rate of rise for the detector versus a room needing to get all the way up over 100 degrees before it sets off. And we're talking Fahrenheit here. So the rate of rise detectors are great for low temperature environments, but again, not life safety devices. These are good for garages, commercial kitchens, workshops, places like that where smoke is expected, be it smoke, exhaust, so on and so forth. They are very, very immune to false alarms because, again, you have to have a very high temperature for these to set off. I have personally seen a heat detector in an attic set off on an extremely hot summer day. It's possible, but it's very rare. I've also seen the same thing in a commercial kitchen. They had the uh, detector directly above a pizza oven. And while it gets hot up there, it does. It's carbon monoxide detectors. Most residential codes are now requiring at least a couple of these in the house. They're great to have. They can be a combination with smoke detectors. They're very important to have if you have gas or oil heat or appliances. Also, if you have an attached garage, or in the case of a home haunter, you might have a garage haunt or something you've built in your driveway. If there's vehicles running nearby, it's very possible exhaust could build up inside of your outdoor haunt or inside of your garage, so on and so forth. And you don't want your actors who are already in hot stuffy masks getting this carbon monoxide exposure and, I mean, they could pass out on you. you. You don't know that. And if you're not going through frequently, your patrons see someone in a mask passed out, they just assume it's a prop. This also goes for generators. Even if you are a outdoor haunt that has buildings from place to place, if there's generators outside those buildings and the wind's going just right, you could have carbon monoxide buildup. These are important to have as well. Usually when the detector starts to go off, it is still, it's not a safe amount, but it's not an immediate danger amount. It's a take action amount. However, a lot of these detectors don't have any indicator on them of the level of carbon monoxide. Some have meters and you can see the number on and it'll tell you the dangerous level, the low level, high level, so on and so forth. But if one of these goes off, take action. Shut off your heater. Look for that vehicle with the exhaust or that generator with the exhaust. And correct that quickly. Because again, you cannot smell carbon monoxide. And the side effects can range anywhere from a mild headache to potentially death. If a person were to go unconscious and be exposed for a prolonged period of time. From this point, things start to go more in the commercial direction and get a little more expensive. Water flow detectors are detectors that are attached to a sprinkler system, and they detect any movement of water in said sprinkler system. If a sprinkler head were to break, water flows, that's going to set off a water flow sensor. That way you know the sprinklers have been triggered, and that will set off your fire alarm. Unless you have a very special type of system, that's not going to set off all the other sprinkler heads in the building. Contrary to your typical movie where someone pulls the fire alarm and the sprinklers go off, that's only very special systems we'll talk about in a little bit. The one thing about water flow systems, like heat sensors, it's late detection. At the point a water flow is going, a sprinkler head is broken, and unless it was an accident or vandalism, that means it got hot enough inside a room to set off a sprinkler head. You already have a pretty good sized problem before a water flow alarm goes. Usually, these don't have false alarms, although if you're in a seismically active area where water could shift back and forth, or if there's any weird water type situation per se, the local water main gets hit. 
you could have issues with this due to that. If you lose pressure, the water backflows, so on and so forth. There are beam detectors. These are optical beams that cover a very large area point to point, kind of like a garage door opener, although for much larger areas, usually warehouses. Be sure not to block these. They're in place because they're a lot cheaper than having heat detectors or smoke detectors the entire way across a warehouse. So this beam, if it's blocked at any point substantially between the transmitter, the reflector, and the receiver, will set off a smoke alarm for you. There are visible flame detectors that look for actual flames. There's a gamut of these. UV-based, infrared-based, infrared thermal, visible. They're expensive detectors. These are usually going to be in more commercial, industrial environments. They're not very common, but if you have them, there might be some maintenance involved just in keeping the sensors clean, so on and so forth. I've not personally encountered these, but again, if you've taken over some sort of factory, they might be there. There are also aspirating, also known as sniffer systems. These use a series of pipes that circulate air throughout a building. From each and every room, it will be pulling air that goes into a sampling chamber, samples the air for usually just smoke, but it also could be byproducts of combustion, carbon monoxide, or different things, special threats if it is a manufacturing facility or something of that nature. There are also, these are a little more common, duct detectors. It's a smoke detector in a heating, ventilation, or air conditioner system in the duct. These are a early alert type detector because typically if there's smoke, it's going to be pulled into the air returns. And you don't want smoke being circulated throughout a building. So this is a way for the building itself to find smoke before it's actually detected in a single location. There's usually a reset device near these. It's usually key-based. So it's usually a test and reset device, just because you can't really get into the duct to test the detector, at least not easily. Most commercial detectors will have a small testing button on them somewhere. Unlike residential, where there's a press button to make it actually sound, the commercial ones, usually it's a small hole that a technician uses a tool to test. There's also spray smoke. Some inspectors prefer the spray because it's actually testing the smoke sensing portion of the detector. However, once you do this, you have to make sure to clean out the detector, usually uh, canned air or something of that nature, because otherwise that could actually cause a false alarm later on if the wind were to blow, so on and so forth. The actual press button test, there's not going to be a false alarm after that. That's more of a test of the system than it is the detector, though. Moving on to notification devices. You'll hear this referred to as the NAC, Notification Appliance Circuit, if your technicians are talking to you about the system. These would be your bells and sirens. That's usually old school. I've seen a lot of the schools around here the older buildings still have bells in them. They're mechanical. They use a little bit of voltage, and they're somewhat less than reliable. I've heard some bells that sounded like anything from a wrestling bell to a full-blown loud ringing bell. They're old school. They're being phased out. The sirens, these are usually outside of the house. Way back in the day, before 911 and monitored systems, there would be a very loud siren pointing towards the nearest firehouse. And I've seen that as well. They sound like air raid sirens. It's kind of funny. Uh, you probably won't see these unless you're buying a real old facility. And from my experience, they're almost always in a metal box, so birds don't get in them, and they're usually rusted out. Horn strobes are more common. They come in three different varieties. There's the horns, where it's a horn only, just a loud electronic buzz. Uh, volume on some of these can be varied because you don't want it too loud in a small room, but you also don't want it too quiet in a large room. Horn strobes are the horns, but they have an added strobe light for the hearing impaired. The strobe lights also usually variable brightness. The current generation, they're going with LED, they're pretty bright. The older generations were either actual strobes, sometimes they were even behind a red filter. The new stuff's all usually white light though, so it's real obvious, real bright. There are also strobe-only devices. There is no horn to it. These are usually placed in bathroom stalls or very small rooms. 
because the horn would be overpowering in something like a bathroom stall. The horn strobes also come in wall or ceiling mount applications, and there are also weatherproof outdoor models so that the fire department can see the building when they're driving by. It just makes it easier to find a facility with an alarm activated if they can see the light flashing and hear the horn. This also notifies anyone on your campus not to go inside if the fire alarm is going off, because otherwise they might be in the door before they know there's an alarm situation. The newest, latest, greatest, and most expensive are voice evacuation systems. These usually have a tone, and then they give directions. You'll see this in a lot of shopping malls, hospitals, higher-end facilities, maybe some newer schools. Honestly, us haunters probably aren't going to be seeing these in our venues just because it's a lot of money unless your fire marshal is making you install it or unless you just happen to stumble across a facility that was recently built and then for some reason uh, went out of business and came for sale. These are going to be the newer code soon if they're not already in code for you. There's a lot of grandfathering that takes place with fire alarm systems. Frankly, a lot of the fire inspectors and marshals are happy that you have a system, period, that works. So hopefully you don't have to make the jump to voice evacuation systems, but they're definitely the new thing. The nice thing with them as well, with the more advanced systems, they can do shelter in place for storms, things like that. They can do lockdown, various things, but we're only talking fire today. There are also out there Halon systems. Now, you probably won't see this unless you're taking over an office building or perhaps a warehouse or data center, something of that nature. Halon is a non-damaging gas for computers. It displaces the oxygen in a room. By displacing the oxygen, it puts a fire out. Fire needs heat, fuel, and oxygen to burn. You take away any one of those three, it will go out. And fortunately, when the Halon removes the oxygen from a room, it also means humans can't breathe so it's potentially fatal. These systems are a little more complex. They're not going to just trigger without warning. There's usually some sort of a countdown. There's usually also a delay button in the room where the system's installed, so if it was an accidental activation, someone can stand there, hold the delay button, and the system will not trigger, so they can either notify someone to come help and reset the system, so on and so forth. There should be should be some directions with this and signage because these systems are a little more complicated than most but you could find these in any sort of facility that had sensitive computer equipment data rooms even very sensitive document storage because again it's a non-damaging gas for computers or sensitive equipment but usually it's a smaller room as well if you do come across this i would check with your local fire alarm company or fire suppression company and get that squared away. It's possible to have a system decommissioned, but then you might have to look into otherwise protecting the room. But these are potentially dangerous if you don't know what you're doing with it. Further complicating the situation, Halon is actually no longer being manufactured because it has a very negative effect on the ozone layer and environment when it's released. So if a Halon system needs to be serviced, recharged, anything of that nature, you're going to have to retrofit or totally replace the system, and that's going to be some serious money. So again, research these systems before you get into a building that has one. Sprinklers. These are in most commercial buildings. Some residential building codes are starting to require them as well. A few different types, again, just like everything else. Wet pipe is the most common system, meaning there's water in the pipes at all times. That water is pressurized and ready to go, but it's held back by the sprinkler heads. The sprinkler head is a nozzle, which has a small glass vial full of a thermally reactive material. Once that chemical inside expands enough, it'll break the glass head and allow the water to flow freely. These are common. You'll see these in most office buildings, almost all schools, if not all. They can do some damage if accidentally triggered. There's also a freeze concern with these, which is why dry pipe systems exist. In cold areas like parking garages, freezers, possibly in warehouses that are not well heated, you'll see a dry pipe systems, meaning that it looks just like a conventional sprinkler system, 
although there's pressurized air in the pipes, the sprinkler head breaks from the heat, and then the air is released, or the air pressure is released, a check valve inside the pipe further up the line in a heated or at least well insulated room, then lets water fill into the pipe, and it will send water out of whatever head broke from the heat. These are possibly something you'll come across if you have a warehouse location for a haunt, especially if you're in a colder climate. Anywhere above the Mason-Dixon line, you could be seeing these in any sort of warehouse. If you're building a haunt from scratch and they do require sprinklers, dry pipe is something to consider, especially if you don't plan to heat the facility all winter. There are deluge systems. These are kind of like a dry pipe system, except there's no stopper on the sprinkler heads at all. Sprinkler heads are wide open, ready to flow water, and all of them are. This system is triggered by either a pull station, or it could be a single or a couple different smoke detectors. Long story short, once it activates, it sends water out to all the heads all at once. This is like what you see in the movies. It's not in schools like you see in the movies. It's not very common at all. It's usually for very special, large rapid fire loads. It could be a paper mill. It could be a large warehouse that holds a lot of flammable materials because this is using a lot of water and you can't really isolate it. It's all or nothing. So these are uncommon, thankfully, but if this was to go off, it would be a whole lot of water and really fast. So hopefully your venue doesn't have a deluge system. But again, if you're in a warehouse, something like that, it's possible. If you are in a venue like that, Keep it in mind, because if you have electronics, amplifiers, speakers, things like that, this is a lot of water, it will ruin them. Also, keep your electrical up, up off the floor, because you don't want that sitting in water. Which, again, deluge systems are a lot of water and fast. There are pre-action systems. These are usually museums, high-end libraries, larger data centers, where Halon's not practical due to the room size. These require two things to activate meaning it's usually a dry pipe system. The smoke alarm goes off, the pipe fills with water, but then the sprinkler head still has to activate before it sends out water. This is just to protect things like a museum. You don't want to lose a priceless painting because somebody uh, accidentally broke a sprinkler head. Foam systems, these are not very common at all. However, air hangers or some manufacturing facilities that have a lot of chemicals, be it a paint manufacturer or something like that, might have this for very special fire loads. Again, not common, but it mixes a foam solution with the water in the sprinkler system, and this is going to be a little bit expensive to maintain. Foam does go bad. There are also dry chem kitchen systems, usually in commercial kitchens. This will be the nozzles you see that are pointed at the cooktop on the range or stove, so on and so forth. And this is a special type of dry chem designed to control grease type fires. It's usually a manual activation. You'll see a pull station on the wall, but it doesn't look like your standard fire alarm pull station. Commonly around here, they're silver with red text on them, round, there's a little pull ring. If you're in a kitchen, you should know about these. If you're using the kitchen, this should be tested, inspected, and up to date because these can mean the difference between a minor kitchen fire being controlled or losing your kitchen. Make sure your kitchen staff are well trained on this. You don't want someone setting it off by accident, and you also don't want them setting it off unless they need to. We all know there's occasionally a boil over that can be controlled easily, but if they need to use it, don't let them hesitate, because this can make a big difference in fast. That's Fire alarms in general, it's again a surface level review. You do need to be careful when dealing with your local installers. A lot of them unfortunately price gouge like crazy. I used to do this for a living. This is some insider info. Uh, if my local cohorts that I used to work with find out about this, I might be in trouble, but I don't care. I don't want to see you guys getting ripped off because I've seen too many haunts pay 
huge, huge sums of money for fire alarm systems that were totally out of check. All of these prices are for name brand devices. I'll start with conventional smoke detectors for commercial use, the type I used to install, are $36. The addressable versions that are a little higher end and give you that programmability, $56. Indoor horn strobes, be it a wall or ceiling mount horn strobe, $43. Pool stations, the conventional type, $26. The addressable type, $79. Keypads, the uh, control keypad where you program things or set or disarm the alarm, about $170. Various control panels for four zones or less are usually about or a little bit less than $1,000. You might see them between $400 and $1,000 depending on the system size. There are specialty panels that might be needed if you have a larger system or if your system has to tie in with elevators or other buildings in a facility, per se, or in a shopping mall. That's just a general guideline there. If you get a quote from someone and the prices look crazy, you do have to figure in labor. The wire's not cheap. Depending where you're at, these guys may or may not be union. They may or may not be running the wire inside of EMT conduit. And they may or may not be all doing the work. Some areas, electricians will run the wire, and then alarm technicians will do the programming and installing the individual devices. But nonetheless, if you get a price quote and they want several hundred dollars a detector, check them. Feel free to email me, call me, look me up on the website. I will take a look over your invoice for you because I've seen far too many haunts nearly put out of business or even put out of business because they got a quote for a fire alarm they were mandated to have that was absolute insanity. I'll reiterate, none of what I've said here is set in stone. There are variations in the technology and codes across the country. Some codes may or may not even allow conventional systems anymore. Some codes, if it's an old code, might not even allow an addressable system, although that would be rare. Check with your local professionals. Get more than one quote. That's huge. Uh, there's usually more than one fire alarm outfit in town. And don't be afraid to bring somebody from slightly out of town. But you don't want to go too far. Because if you were to have a system malfunction, you want to be able to get a technician out pretty quickly to be able to service that. Also, check references of the company that you're looking at having service your system. Unfortunately, there are a lot of great installers out there but then when it comes time for a service call or an inspection or a test, it's pulling teeth to get them out to your location, especially if it's warranty work. This is in part just due to supply and demand in the industry. There is a shortage of technicians out there right now, especially ones that are worth their salt. It's very possible that the company is doing their best, but will have a hard time getting someone out to you, and especially in our industry where our entire business year takes place in a month or less. Time is money for us. And just make sure that your installers know that. And know that if you have an issue on a Friday night, it can't wait until Monday. Unlike most other businesses, a single weekend is almost a business quarter for us. One very important note I almost forgot to include here is that there are parts of a fire alarm system which will need to be replaced over time. The backup batteries typically last three to five years. However, if you have multiple power outages or very prolonged power outages, that time will be cut down drastically. Carbon monoxide detectors typically last five to seven years until they no longer detect properly. The uh, detection just goes out of range one way or the other. Smoke detectors last 10 years, after which your calibration also drifts and they may set false alarms or not alarm at all. The test buttons on carbon monoxide or smoke detectors only usually test the battery and siren, not the detection element inside the detectors. So if the test button does not work and replacing a battery doesn't resolve that, definitely get a new detector. If the test button does work but they're over their expected lifespan, still get a new detector. This is some money, 
but in the long run, it's going to save you some headache with false alarms or worst case scenario, not alarming when there actually is an emergency. So I hope this helps everyone. Again, feel free to reach out for further help. I installed these systems for years, and I'm also an active firefighter, so I work with them all the time. I'm not going to lie, there is some weird stuff out there. There are technicians that are not with their salt and do things totally backwards. So good luck. And again, before you buy a location, check out the fire alarm system. You don't want to get into a huge mess that's going to cost you more than the cost to buy the location just so you can meet code and open to the public. Thanks for listening. Go to hauntechtips.com for show notes and more.